illusion and ego. In order to make the transition from the cultural historical considerations of yesterday to the perspectives I will discuss tomorrow, I must interrupt with a kind of episodic lecture today, which will, perhaps, seem to be quite far afield. However, even if it comes in the form of a fairly complicated lecture, these things must also be included in our considerations. Two forces disrupt human life, both appearing within it in a way that is puzzling, a way that demands to be understood because it falls outside the conventionally accepted course of human life. The first has to do with the fact that human beings are capable of having illusions, of surrendering themselves to such illusions. The other has to do with the fact that human beings can also degenerate into wickedness. The influence of illusions and the influence of wickedness in human life is one of the greatest mysteries of our existence. Now, I have in the past had cause at various times to point out the mystery of these two facts of life. The mystery, the secret, is only a mystery because thinking about it falls outside of the normal streams of human thought. And all of the thoughts related to the presence of illusions and wickedness in human life are connected to the problem, the mystery, of illness and death the full depths of which are not actually felt by most human beings, as is the case with all mysteries, because they are accustomed to having illusions, wickedness and illness and death as part of their lives. The only person who must find these things altogether unintelligible is the one who starts with a materialistic understanding of life. In particular, the materialistically minded individual will have continually to ask, how can I reconcile these deviations from the normal and natural course of life, the deviations that occur in sickness and in death? The laws of nature supposedly at work in all organisms are doubtlessly expressed in the normal healthy course of life, but sickness and death abnormally disrupt this normal course of life. In order to develop something healthy within the afflicted worldview of civilized humanity, we must learn to see in time that sickness and death, that wickedness and illusions, can only be understood from the perspective of a spiritual worldview. As a human being standing in the world, as a physical expression of the facts known to you, it must be clear to you that your development would not be possible if the only things at play within your being were the natural laws described in mainstream contemporary science. Consider just for a moment the following from the perspective of healthy human understanding. Think to yourself, the vital life forces within me sometimes become livelier than they are under so-called normal conditions they become livelier, for example, when I have a fever, livelier than I am able to manage or control. In these instances, when you do not rise to the occasion, when you do not win the upper hand over the forces of nature within, you lose consciousness, or at the very least your consciousness moves into an abnormal state. Anyone wishing to objectively understand life must realize that life and consciousness are two separate things. We are conscious, we have consciousness, when we have control over our life forces. When those life forces overwhelm us, when they reach a fever pitch and we lose our control over them, it becomes impossible to maintain proper consciousness. To put it briefly, this results in the following conclusion. Our life forces, as well as those forces that aggravate our lives into fevers and passions, cannot also be the forces of our consciousness. If you step back and consider human evolution as it has played out in the cosmos, you will find that earth consciousness, parenthesis, which is what people nowadays usually mean when they speak about general human consciousness, 
and which will also be the sole focus of today's lecture, close parenthesis, only appeared later in that evolution. <laughs> this earth consciousness was preceded by other dimmer forms of consciousness. I have often indicated to you before that this, our planet Earth, was itself preceded by an earlier planetary incarnation called the Moon Incarnation. At that time when human consciousness was bound up with the Moon Incarnation of our planet, human beings had only a kind of dream consciousness. But at that time, parenthesis, as you may already know from my book, Title and Outline of Esoteric Science, close parenthesis, it was also filled with life forces to a greater extent than today's Earth consciousness. And when we go even farther back in time, to even earlier planetary incarnations of our Earth, we find that more and more life processes were active in the human beings alive during those incarnations. Human beings back then lived lives in connection with the whole of the cosmos. But we will not find any form of consciousness present in human beings prior to the moon consciousness, except the kind we know of from dreamless sleep. In other words, from the perspective of Earth, there was no consciousness at all prior to moon consciousness. Having evolved through these earlier incarnations, during which they were filled to a greater extent with life forces, but consequently could not have earth consciousness, human beings have now arrived at a less lively form of being that does possess this earth consciousness. We have also spoken in the past about the bodily conditions that make this earth consciousness possible. In the center of our consciousness, in our head, we have certain processes continuously occurring. If these head processes, however, were to extend into the rest of the physical body, they would, by their very nature, move our physical body into a state of death. Our head processes are effectively the same as the processes that occur in our physical organism when it becomes a corpse. For as long as we are alive, these nervous system processes, so similar to the processes of death, are held at bay. They are balanced out by the life processes in the rest of our organism. When these nervous system processes try to extend into the rest of our body, the organization of our torso and limbs <clears throat> is the only thing that can restore life to our body. If the organization of our body was dictated only by our head, we would immediately die or be as good as dead. You can see that it is necessary for the process of dying, of destruction, to play a role in human life. Without the presence and activity of this process of destruction, the illumination of consciousness would not have been possible in human evolution. This must be understood as a necessary part of this particular development. And it is fundamentally foolish to think, well, God is almighty. He could have done it all differently if he wanted. This would be the same as saying, God is almighty. He could make a three-cornered shape with four corners if he wanted to. We are dealing with an essential and fundamental law. It is altogether impossible for consciousness to develop without the integration of the death principle into the human organism. Now, insofar as we live within our physical earth organism, insofar as we are beings of the earth, we are also completely integrated into this earth organism, this earthly existence. The laws of this earthly existence essentially fill our entire organism. It is necessary here to differentiate between the cosmic laws that are in actuality laws of the earth and the cosmic laws that can be considered laws of the earth. We are touching upon a fairly complicated subject here. 
Let us imagine this schematically. <clears throat> when we speak of the whole earth realm, we are dealing with the earth, with the sun, and with a few other things. Everything that works and lives in that realm is somehow connected. But in making that statement that everything that works and lives in that realm is somehow connected, in making that statement, we are actually leaving something out. We are leaving out a crucial fact which centers primarily on the nature of the moon. Strangely, we are in fact living in two different spheres, which do indeed work in and through one another, but which are in their inner nature fundamentally different. The forces working in us that are related to the sun and to the earth are indeed connected with one another, making up one of these two spheres. Inserted then into this sun-earth sphere are all the forces working in us that belong to the moon sphere. Therefore I will draw this like so, earth, E, sun, S, and then a few other things, and there's a drawing on page 18 of the book. First, I will draw the apparent motion of the earth and the sun in relation to one another. Then the moon. If this is the moon sphere, and this is the sphere of the sun, then I must draw the two together, and there's a third picture, in such a way that they fall within the same area while still maintaining the division between the two forces, which cannot be united. And as human beings, we live in the midst of these two divided spheres. Everything that belongs to the moon sphere is a remnant, a carryover from the old moon incarnation. Parenthesis, you can read about this in more detail in my in title and outline of esoteric science. Close parenthesis. These things do not belong in any way to what the earth has become in the process of its evolution. It is a piece left over from the moon and remains in this incarnation like a foreign body of some sort, and we participate both in it and in the earth-sun sphere. For those who wish to understand earthly existence, it is absolutely necessary to be familiar with the separate individual existences of both the earth-sun sphere and the moon sphere. This fact is connected with something extraordinarily important, so important that modern science has not the slightest awareness of it, and furthermore, were it to learn of this, modern science would most likely view it as absurdly foolish. Every human being, as it develops as an embryo, is not merely following the direction of the powers released in the body of the mother through the act of conception. To claim that this is true would be the same as saying, here I have a compass needle that points in a specific direction. The directive powers that cause the compass to point that way must lie within the compass. A physicist would never make such a statement. Every physicist would instead say, well, the earth is a big magnet. One pole tugs at one tip of that compass needle and the other pole tugs at the other tip. In this instance, we are perfectly willing to say that everything associated with the needle, its actions, its effectiveness, its position, is dependent upon something greater. It is only when we speak about the human embryo that we try to say that all of the organizing forces causing that embryo to develop are found within the body of the mother. In actuality, cosmic forces streaming into the mother are what is actually at work in developing and shaping the human being. And so it happens that a human being's consciousness center, the head, is connected with moon forces, and the rest of the bodily organism is connected with sun forces. And as humans we consequently have a divided being. In our head we are moon beings. In the rest of our body we are sun beings. But here the matter becomes far more complicated. If you do not examine it exactly, you will quickly come upon a whole slew of confusions and misunderstanding. Insofar as the human being is a being with a head, 
it is a being of the moon. In other words, the forces of the moon are integrated into the organization of the human head. Insofar as the human being is a being with a torso and limbs, it is a being of the sun. In other words, the forces of the sun are integrated into the organization of the rest of the human body, the torso and limbs. At the same time, however, when we are awake and conscious in the world, our center, our head, is particularly receptive to everything that comes toward us from the sun. When sunlight falls upon us, we take it in through our eyes. The head was created by moon forces, but everything that it receives in the world comes from the sun. And in the rest of our bodily organism, in the torso and limbs, the human being is a sun being meaning the organization of the torso and limbs are established by the sun, but everything that is at work in that organism, for as long as it is on the earth, comes from the moon. Taking all of this into consideration, you could say, the human being's center is a creation of the moon into which the sun flows. The rest of the human being's organism is a creation of the sun in which the moon forces are at work. You can see that if we do not examine these matters precisely, but instead look for more comfortable and familiar concepts, we can easily go astray. It would be very easy for someone to come along and say, the human head is a creation of moon forces. Another would then say, That is not true. It comes from the sun, for it is in this part of the human being that the sun processes take place. Both speakers are correct. But we must come to understand the way in which these two forces interact with one another. I have often said that true reality is not comfortable for us to understand. A few casual concepts will not suffice for a true understanding of reality. We will have to struggle more than a little bit in order to form concepts of reality that actually correspond to it closely. Our sun being and our moon being are at work in a twofold way within each of us. And everything that happens in the course of our lives cannot be understood unless we see ourselves connected in this twofold manner with the cosmos. For the tormented people of today, if they feel properly, then they will feel tormented, one of the most important concerns should be the following, that we have lost the old concepts of reality that humanity once knew through atavistic clarity, and that we now stand in the beginning stages of Copernicanism or Galileoism. We must remind ourselves that the ancient Egyptians saw human beings as one part of a vast cosmos, and that this cosmos was, to an ancient Egyptian, much more intricately intricately organized than the human being. Today we, we human beings look out at the cosmos and see one big piece of machinery that we can understand through mathematical formulas. For the modern human being, the planets move across the sky against the backdrop of the fixed stars, just as human beings move their arms and legs according to mathematical formulas that can be reckoned and figured. But in all that is out there in the cosmos, as well as all that encompasses the human being, there lives an organization that includes both soul and spirit. And for as long as we do not recognize the presence of soul and the suffusion of spirit in the cosmos, we can understand nothing of human life, which is itself but one part of the ensouled and spirit-penetrated cosmos. I would like to suggest that in this we are living within the moon sphere. Living with us in this moon sphere is everything associated with with luciferic powers, and these luciferic powers, by moving through our center, through the organization of our head, are what enable the sun to take part in our earthly existence. 
The luciferic penetrates throughout the whole of our head being, but it is as foreign to earthly existence as the sphere of the moon itself. Our central nervous system is not organized by the same powers that give organization to our heart, lungs, and stomach, and by the same token, the luciferic forces that exist in us are not given form by our earthly soul-spirit being. They are infused into us along with the elements of the moon. Very few people know anything more about the influence of these moon elements in earthly life than what they hear from poets about magical moonlit nights, nighttime love affairs carried out by moonlight. We are familiar with the affinity of these fanciful outpourings for moonlight, which plays a large role in love life, if it is the higher form of love life, the romantic life. Yet this is but the faintest shadow of what comes to us from the moon. The sphere of the moon does not play into our everyday existence only through the fanciful things that occur between two lovers on magical moonlit nights. On the contrary, Deep-seated forces play into our lives from the sphere of the moon, forces that are removed from everyday life, from those things that human beings affix to the earth, just as, by and large, amorous play on magical moonlight nights is removed from ordinary everyday life. And the most extreme thing that can play into our lives from out of this altogether foreign sphere is the power of illusion that human beings are capable of developing. If the forces of the moon sphere were not in us, then as human beings we would not be capable of having illusions. Without this capacity of having illusions, we would not be able to free ourselves from our life forces, from the organizational life of our physical organism, and we would not be able to ascend to that brilliancy of consciousness that we need as human beings. In order to reach that brilliancy of consciousness, it is necessary that we be able to live in mental pictures and imaginations that entirely disengage from our everyday organism. It is then our task to unify them with our everyday organism. It is up to us to not allow these illusions to tear themselves away from reality, but rather to relate them to that reality in the proper manner. <clears throat> in order to have concepts that have no relationship to our physical senses, we must be capable of generating these illusions. It is simply necessary that human beings be capable of having these illusions. And this ability to have illusions is also connected to our ability to do something other than languishing in a feverish or powerless state. It allows us to ascend to an illuminated consciousness. And if we let slip the reins sometimes, if we do not stay in control of our illusions, but instead allow them control over us, then this is simply a necessary side effect of the fact that we absolutely must be capable of having these illusions. So, now I have, on the one hand, shown you the cosmic human origins of our ability to generate illusions, and on the other hand I directed your attention to one aspect of the world in which something we might call a natural necessity merges with something we might call an inner human activity. For the mechanistic manner in which people typically consider things in the world now, both of these things break down entirely. Now for the other sphere. You will perhaps have noticed that I make a slight revision in what I had said, and since you are probably exceptionally attentive, you will no doubt have inwardly reproached me for the fact that I retouched my words in this manner. Namely, I first said, quote, interwoven are the earth-sun sphere and the moon sphere. Close quote. Later I spoke only of the sun sphere. In one sense I was right to do so. 
everything that is at work in our central nervous system, including what comes toward us from the earth, is always a product of the sun. Even the illuminated surfaces of the objects in the world are only reflected sunlight. And thus everything that plays a role in this sphere, including those things that are a part of the earth, parenthesis, insofar as they are conveyed to our conscious life, close parenthesis, is a product of the sun. But not everything. I could allow that statement to stand only up to this point. It is true to say that everything that you process in your consciousness is connected with the sun sphere. But the fact that you will register as a certain weight when you step onto a scale, that fact comes from the earth. In truth, however, the sun sphere, which up until now I was able to describe as one unified sphere, is differentiated in its interior. The earth is a kind of interpolation into this earth-sun sphere, and in that this earth is an interpolation into the earth-sun sphere, it is at work in what comes toward us from the sun. Its presence in that sphere means that we are not purely sun beings. This point clearly shows that we must always remember to consider the cosmos not as a mechanistic object. We must see that it is ensouled and inspirited. Because as human beings we are tied into the earth-sun sphere, we necessarily and naturally follow closely the true earth forces in the unconscious forces working within us. In our conscious actions, we follow what the sun sends to the earth. But if we investigate, which is very difficult to do, what is connected with everything that causes us to weigh a certain amount when we stand on a scale, we find that it is not simply the gravity that Newton described. Rather, it is also caused by everything that we experience as playing a role in our moral life. When it comes to the sun, the poet was right when he said, quote, it shines on the good the same as the bad, close quote. It makes no difference to the sun. But if you investigate the earth by spiritual scientific means, you will find that it does make a difference. The earth is the outward expression of certain forces that want to lift themselves away from our collective planetary system. Just as the moon wanted to sneak its way in, so does the earth desire to make itself scarce. <clears throat> the earth forces want out. They want to be independent. We humans would not have a very particular and very important thing if we did not live under the influence of these earth forces. We would not have any feeling of independence. If you were not pulled downward by Earth's gravity and were instead able to float about in the elements, you would never arrive at independence. Only because you are constantly being tugged at by the Earth, parenthesis, if I may use this expression, which is meant as the expression of a fact and not a theory, close parenthesis, through that constant attraction, you develop your independence. And this is why the earth is incorporated into the earth-sun sphere in order to give us independence. You can again raise an objection here, which in your feeling core you will probably, you have probably already made. Is the same not true for animals? No, it is not the same. For the animal's head is held on a horizontal spine the human head is situated with all its weight over the rest of its physical organism. This makes a difference. This is what causes human beings to have a feeling of independence. The fact that human beings are positioned altogether differently from animals in relation to earth and sun forces. The kinds of questions we are asking here can only be approached by asking after the alternative what would we become if we were left only to the influence of the earth, removed altogether 
from the moon influence? What would become of us if we were left only to the influence of the sun? If human beings were left only to the influence of the sun, we would become a kind of angel, but we would be stupid. This is not to say that angels are stupid. On the contrary, they are brilliant. But we would become a kind of angel that was not brilliant, as are the real angels. We would be stupid. For we would be lacking a feeling of independence. We would simply be limbs in the organism of the cosmos. We have our existence on earth to thank for our independence. If, on the other hand, we were to be only under the influence of the earth, if the sun was not active in us, what would we be then? Beasts, predators, creatures that evolved incredibly wild instincts. Here is a point at which you can peer deeply into the constitution of the universe, because you will say to yourself, the things at work in the universe cannot all come from just this place or just that place. If all the things at work in the universe came from just one place, the result would be a radically extreme existence of one sort or another. If we were only under the influence of the earth, then these earth forces would engender in us incredibly wild instincts. The wild fires of our instincts would rage out of control. If this earth influence were to have no part in our lives, on the other hand, then we would never become independent beings. We must have the potential of becoming wild animals in order to be able to become independent beings. In order to keep us from becoming wild animals, however, the sun influence must counteract the earth influence, must paralyze it. This is what happens. And because it happens in this way, you can catch a glimpse of the origin of evil. Evil and wickedness are simply facts of our earth existence. We are left open to a kind of radical extreme, the earth extreme which, if it alone were allowed to influence us, would make us into wicked creatures, would fill us solely with illusions. In the case of both wickedness and illusions, the sun forces of the cosmos are at work in the world. These sun forces make it possible for us to develop in such a way that we do not lapse into illusions. And these sun forces also make it possible for us to develop in such a way that we do not lapse into a state of wickedness. The influence of illusion in the world makes it possible for us to become intelligent human beings. If everything enabling us to have illusions were not present in the world, then we would never become intelligent human beings. To express it in cosmic terms, if we were not creations of the moon, If we were not, on the one hand, beings capable of having illusions, then we would, on the other hand, exist as beings incapable of intelligence. If we were not cast down onto the earth and into the influence of its forces, we would never have the possibility of doing something evil or wicked. But at the same time, we would have no possibility of developing independence in our lives. You can see that the human being must be able to have illusions in order to be intelligent. Humans have had illusions for a long time. Then came the advent of the human will, which was born into the constitution of the human soul only later in the course of history. At that point people became able to make these illusions into actions that came from the will. For the first time human beings were capable of lying. For a lie, objectively speaking, and separate from its relationship to human beings, is the same thing as an illusion. The only difference is that the person who tells a lie is willfully speaking something that does not originate in reality against the truth of what does exist in reality. So what works into human beings from the moon sphere is simultaneously the creator, the creative being of our intelligence, and also what is enabling us to lie. In ancient times, people recognized this truth and established a proverb based on it. 
we Germans, when we see a moon that looks like this, a left crescent, say that the moon nimpt zu. We might amend the shape of the moon a little to make it into a Z. When we see a moon that looks like this, a right crescent, we say that the moon nimpt up. We might amend the shape of the moon to make it into an A. If you go back into the origins of the French language, into the lingering after-effects of the Roman language, then you would say upon seeing the waning moon, la luna de croix, de croix from de crotra. Sorry. In that case, the moon does not describe its own behavior. On the contrary, it says the opposite. The moon only began to speak the truth to the German people. For this reason, we have the Latin proverb, the moon is a liar. But this proverb also has esoteric truth, for the forces that come from the moon are simultaneously the forces of human lying and deception. And this proverb, the moon is a liar, has a very, very deep foundation, as you can now see. <clears throat> Only after civilization crossed over into the 15th century did the moon begin to tell the truth to certain languages regarding its physical shape, as materialism also began to speak the truth regarding its physical appearance. But in regard to its inner being, the moon is still a proper liar. I tell you this for mnemonic purposes, so that you can remember this deep-seated cosmic human truth. And you see, one of the best things that we humans have, independence, is inwardly connected with wickedness and evil, and the other, intelligence, is inwardly connected with our ability to have illusions, with the possibility of erring. We as human beings must be capable of development. We must have the possibility to not merely remain in one place. This capacity for development would not be possible if we were not called upon to build anew on the foundation of what has been destroyed. This means that we must bear within us the possibility of illness and death so that we can develop within ourselves the forces for building anew. These extremely important truths have been completely whitewashed by the world views of the last several centuries, completely buried by them. If something moves outside of the realm of mathematics and mechanics, it can be called science only when it deals with something that happens on the earth. Outside of the earth, only mathematically and mechanically comprehensible concepts are at work in existence. We must first come to understand again that altogether different forces are at work in the space through which the moon moves and through which the stars follow their course that they do not simply move in paths directed by impulses intelligible by mechanics. And when you realize that most everyday things are a product of the cosmos, that the most common everyday things cannot be understood unless we consider the human being as a product of the cosmos, then how can you intend to infuse with fruitful thoughts those contemporary world views that are supposed to inspire our lives? Nowadays, human beings are forsaken by the world. They do not even begin to suspect their true connection with it. <laughs> and they would like to establish themselves as social beings, but do not even know with whom or with what, because they have not the slightest idea what they really are. Yes, until certain questions infiltrate the human soul, how little do we actually know about the world? Under the influence of the last few centuries, how many things are we missing? Until these questions fill our beings, there is no hope for any kind of social striving. Where they are able to speak mechanically or mathematically, human beings nowadays are still willing to establish connections with certain phenomena. They know that a wide range of things are connected with the cycle of sunspots, epidemics and other such things on the earth. There are still a few places where human beings on earth desire some attachment to the experience of the cosmos, but people would prefer to deny that everything which occurs in earthly existence 
is an experience of the whole cosmos. They would like not to think about it. The things that happen among human beings on the earth will never be understood if they are not understood cosmically. And we cannot come up with effective ideas for our work on earth if we do not immerse these ideas in a conscious awareness of our connection with the cosmos. If we only look at the way things actually play out in history, we are left with a bitter feeling. Were there a wall here with an assortment of shadows flitting back and forth across its surface, you would be able to see where the shadows were coming from. When you look at what has happened on the earth in the last five or six years, you will not discover where these things come from, though they are also only projections, shadows of the things that are occurring in the whole of the cosmos. And the great questions that are at play nowadays between various regions of the earth can only be understood when that understanding is filled with cosmic ideality. I read an article today that expressed hope that the statesmen of Great Britain will find the proper impulse to create peace and order between what is happening in Russia and what is happening in the Western countries. To this end, there was a desire to build up something in between the two, in the downward spiraling Germany. These hopes will go unfulfilled, for everything that is spoken in this spirit, everything that depends upon the knowledge of those who are creating things out of the old, all of that will come to nothing. The only thing that is fruitful for the future is what is created entirely out of the new. Once humanity wakes up enough, to see the truth of this, it will mark the beginning of salvation from many harmful things in human evolution.